Hi, these are Brother Merrill's Inspirational Stories. I've bought many, many old books that have wonderful stories contained in them. I'd like to start with a story that's found in Preston Nibley's Pioneer Stories. The one I'd like to tell you about today is of my great-great-grandfather. He was quite an amazing man. When he was a young man, he immigrated from New Brunswick, and they had a small home. He'd begun to make his living by logging. There was a huge demand for this natural material that was so abundant in the hills. And most of the people in the Wasatch today don't really know that we're surrounded by signs of the pioneers still. As you look up in the hills around in the mountains around Salt Lake and in Utah County, you can see in the center of gullies quite often, there's just a little path that comes down and nothing grows in it. Those are logging chutes that the old pioneers developed. They would climb up these steep mountains. You can see on the side of Lone Peak, there's a beautiful crow foot that, and that's what that is. That, that crow foot that you see on the side of Little Willow Canyon, a group of logging chutes that came out of that big stand of pines that's still up there. Just as you enter Mill Creek Canyon on the south side of the road, just East of the mouth of the canyon, you can see an old logging chute. But in the winter of 1854, the winter began with quite a bit of snow. And logging became very difficult because they couldn't get the animals up to where they loaded the logs. So a group of men, including Mariner Wood Merrill, spent a better part of a week clearing a path up into the mouth of Mill Creek Canyon, and each man would cut down his own trees, limb the trees, and use the hand spike to roll them over and send them down the chute. Mariner said it got bitter cold, extremely cold. He didn't know how cold. But one morning he got up and his wife pled with him not to go today. It's just too cold. And he said, you know, honey, I got, I've got to go work. I've got, we've got to make a living. And so he got the oxen hooked up to the sled, and he made his way up the, the path that they'd cleared. And when he got to the temporary logging spot, he found that all the other men had listened to their wives, and he was alone. So he secured his oxen and uh, gave them some hay, and then he climbed about a half mile up the mountain, and he cut down five trees and limbed them, and then he used his logging spike, to, his hand spike, to, to roll these logs over. He described them as being about 30 feet long, 10 inches at the butt, and 6 inches at the crown. And red pine is very dense. And so we're talking some very, very heavy logs. I'm sure they were closing on a ton apiece. And uh, he slid them down the logging chute on the side of the hill about a distance of a half a mile, he says. And then he got them rolled over below his sled. He describes it as a logging bunk, which means he had some, some braces on the side to hold the logs in, and then he'd chain them down. And so with a great deal of struggle, he was able to finally get the first log up. And he said the bunk, the, the bottom of the sled, was slick and icy. And so he got the the big old log up there and he braced it. He found some limbs and was to hold it in place. And then he turned to get the next log. And as he did, the first log gave way. And it hit him right in the hollow of his legs and knocked the hand spike completely out of his reach and sprawled him across those four logs. And it was laying right on the hollow of his legs and his legs were on the ground. His upper body was pinned against these logs. And he couldn't move. It would be like having a small car on your legs. He just couldn't move. And he fought and he fought. And he tried everything he could. He tried squirming around. He tried pushing. He tried wedging. He tried leveraging. And he, could, he was a strong man. And he could not 
get free. And he said as he realized his predicament, he, he came to the realization that this was probably where he would die, by himself in the Utah mountains in the dead of winter on a cold, cold day. He thought of his wife, he thought of his newborn little girl, and then he lost consciousness. The next thing he knew, he came to, his oxen were working their way down the canyon. He looked down, he was sitting on his coat. There were three logs on the sled with two more logs on top. They were chained securely and he yelled to the animals and they stopped and he tried to get up, but he was so bruised and injured from this huge log hitting him in the back that he couldn't even move and he couldn't stand up. And so with a great deal of effort, he was able to get his coat up over his shoulders and he looked down and he could see his ax was bedded in the end of one of the logs just as he would have done. And the logs were laid out, three on the bottom, two on the top, just like he had designed in his mind that he was going to do. That's what he had intended. And then he gave the oxen their head and they made their way home. Kind of the, the self-driving car of the 1855s. And uh, his wife had expected him to be home early that day because he told her that he would just get a small load and come home early. But it was well past the time he should have been home. So when she heard him coming up to the home, she ran out. And he couldn't even get off the wagon. So she was able to carry him in the house. And it was over a week before he could come back outside and do anything. He was almost completely disabled by this huge log hitting him in the back. And I'd like to read what, what he says. I find it very interesting, especially... He has a notation about the, the age and the attitude of people. He says, um, I have hesitated to narrate this incident because of the skepticism which is so common at the present day. Even among some who profess to be saints, considering things somewhat supernatural. I thought... The more things change, the more they say the same. Eh? Then he continues, But I can truly testify in all soberness that some power which I did not see assisted me from the position which doubtless would have speedily cost me my life, as I was preserved for some purpose known to my Heavenly Father, so do I also know that God will bless and preserve the lives of his faithful children just as long as it is necessary for them to live to accomplish their missions upon the earth. And I truly believe that. I know that God is never surprised when someone shows up on the other side. And I also know that he knows me and he loves me, and he loves you. I hope you've enjoyed this story. Thanks. This has been Brother Merrill's Inspirational Stories. There are more to come. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>